1947, they started building this dam on a vision, right? So we're gonna put three dams on a system and create electricity, which is the start of electrifying BC. So if you think about what we're doing now, we're building off that vision and, and we've got a solid foundation to construct an even more reliable dam. Dams are pretty damn old, or at least middle-aged, because here in British Columbia, the average age of a dam is 52 years old. Now, BC Hydro own and operate 82 dams and 30 powerhouses here in British Columbia, providing clean power to 5 million people. But as these critical bits of infrastructure get older, all whilst demand for electricity increases, how do we ensure we keep the electricity system in working order? Well, we're on Vancouver Island to find out, and this is The Fully Charged Show. Love the Fully Charged Show? Join us live in Canada this September, the South in October, and Australia and London in 2025. The John Hart Dam was built in 1947 on this, the Campbell River. And over its lifetime, it's undergone a number of different upgrades, starting in the 1980s when upgrades were made to make it stronger. But in 2014, BC Hydro identified some safety concerns owing to the seismic activity in this region. We're currently very, very near a tectonic plate boundary, meaning this area is likely to receive a magnitude 9 earthquake every 300 to 800 years, the last of which was 324 years ago. But in order to make those upgrades so that this can be much more resilient to seismic activity, a number of other things had to happen first. First of all, the powerhouse, which used to be just there, had to go underground and now it sits in a 10 storey high underground cavern that is the length of an NFL football pitch. And additionally, the pen socks where water flows used to sit above ground, they also had to be moved underground. Now that that project has been completed, they can kickstart the next phase of work, which should last for the next six years, to make this less vulnerable to seismic activity, with the intention being that water could pass safely from upstream all the way downstream, should there ever be a magnitude 9 earthquake. Well, it was built many years ago. It was built just after World War II, and um, it was built at a time we didn't have a, uh, the current understanding we have today of seismic risk, earthquake risk. So here in, in British Columbia, we've always paid a lot of attention to the safety of our dams. We have a program that assesses the, the dam against the current standards and expectations that takes into account the current uh, views on um, earthquakes and major floods and, and the hazards that we can experience. And we are regularly investing in the, in the structures to ensure they're safe and the people that live downstream of them can have confidence in the integrity of the dams. Just to explain a little bit about what's going on behind me. So to my right is the reservoir. It's the third reservoir and it's the smallest reservoir. So on site they've been describing this as the bathtub, which feeds the bucket, which feeds the teacup. That is the teacup over there. And over that way it goes down the penstocks to the powerhouse to generate electricity. So right now the John Hart facility is the teacup of the system. So if you go upstream to the bathtub, that's Strathcona Dam, which is the upper Camel Reservoir. So that houses a lot of the water um, that is generated in the, in the Strathcona powerhouse, which then comes down to the low, into the bucket, which is the lower Camel Reservoir. Mm -hmm. So the generating station on that is called Lador Generating Station. Um, from Lador, you come down through Lador into John Hart, where your teacup is. So that's where we're at now. So if you talk about Strathcona, we have a um, earth-filled dam and also a power station. So that is actually going to be upgraded to a new low level outlet channel. So for seismic reliability, um, in the event there's an earthquake that happened right now, we would have a significant impact downstream. So if you think about it, if something happened up there, it would come down to lower Campbell res Reservoir then into this little teacup where we don't have much reservoir capacity. As you come out of Strathcona, you go down to Lador. So we're do also doing a seismic upgrade project there, which is doing the gate structure. So if you think about how this how it works is you have these gates that regulate the reservoir levels and then you have an intake structure that goes into the power to generate electricity. Um, so we generate electricity there and then we also generate electricity here. The water is actually generated three times as it comes down the system. And the other thing that we hear about is that this is the uh, salmon capital of the world. Yeah. This is an important habitat for salmon. How are they coping with all of this building work going on? <laughs> yeah, so the Copa, we do a lot. 
for the salmon uh, capital of the world to keep making sure that we keep it that way. So there's a lot of programs that BC Hydro implements. So um, one of the ones is we support installing gravel in the reservoir. So uh, we have a tram that delivers gravel. So the BC Conf Conservation Society uh, puts that gravel in, but we support that. Uh, we also um, do a lot of fish dumps, so carcass dumping over the dams. So we dump nutrients into the river. Uh, we do a lot of trapping um, count fish counts. There's multiple times a year that we put divers in the river to count the fish to ensure what we're doing upstream is not impacting the future. Uh, we want to keep that salmon capital of the world. So I'm looking at um, two very, very different colours of water. What's going on? So right now we're standing on the concrete main dam and we have a double line silt curtain. So we identified that we needed to work in the reservoir. So how do we protect the drinking water reservoir? So if you think about this, the drinking water reservoir is right here and our intake is one of those buoys out there. So we wanted to make sure how do we protect this from getting outside? So what the contractor came up with is a, a floating dock system with a double line silt curtain. Uh, silt curtains that range from 20 meters deep to about two meters deep. So, and then they're on the bottom, they're anchored with a large chain. And so that chain actually seals to the bottom of the reservoir. And then we have a one on the outside, which is the outer curtain. We do the same thing. Um, and once that is all done, we then have to do a fish salvage. So we have to come in here and we salvage all the fish from within the curtain. And then we take all those fish out and we put them back on the other side. And so then we can start our work. And we've been very successful in the um, installation and maintenance during the construction. And we haven't had any exceedances outside the curtain. Now, if there is an instance, say, following a seismic event, and actually there's an overspill event, the level of the reservoir rises too high and it tips over the edge, that could cause a serious flooding incident. So what they're doing here is making a spillway so that that overflowing incident can be much more controlled and feed the Campbell River in a really safe way. On the other side of the river, you can see an earth berm, and this is basically like an earth-built dam. And the role of a berm is to provide that stability, and it's almost like imagining you've got a hand pushing against that body of water. And that's what's going on over there. And most importantly, this crane here is fully electric. I think what blows my mind is that the John Hart Dam is still operating but being upgraded at the same time. How complex is that and, and how do you balance that requirement of need to keep it operating but also need to do these very, very crucial upgrades? Well that's one of the challenges with the dam is you have to upgrade it while it's continuing to perform its function. We are can, we're relying on the dam to generate electricity for Vancouver Island. Uh, the dam is, um, the reservoir behind the dam provides drinking water for the local community. Um, there's uh, fish and wildlife that live around the dam, so it, it has to, um, it has to maintain, it has to be maintained in, in full operating mode um, through the, the life of the construction. So that relies, um, requires uh, tremendous planning, so a lot of work went into the design and there was tremendous testing and vetting of the design to make sure we had the right approach. And then there's a whole sequencing and planning of the work to ensure it can be done safely. But um, you, know, you know, you never know when you're going to have an earthquake during construction. You don't know um, if there's going to be a big flood, a big rain event. So it has to be able to perform its basic functions throughout the construction. And that's uh, just one of the constraints you manage when you're upgrading a dam. This is a huge infrastructure project that must stimulate so many jobs for the local community. How are you engaging with those communities from that perspective and how many jobs does it bring to an area? There is um, a large construction workforce on Vancouver Island and, and they really appreciate the opportunity to stay home. Often people go and travel to do that kind of work, so great to, to stay in their local community and, and do work like this. We've also um, done a lot of um, a lot of the construction work is performed by our First Nations partners. Um, there's three First Nations uh, there, the Wewakai, the Wewakum and the Comox First Nations and and there is um, uh, both employment um, by their members on the the project um, and they're also taking on some of the construction work as subcontractors to the main contractor so that's an important contribution to the community as well.
There is a bit of a broader issue here because whilst hydroelectric dams offer dispatchability and very, very low levelised cost of electricity over their lifetime, the demand for power is increasing. Here in BC, that's roughly by 15% by 2030. And additionally, the impacts of things like El Nino, the resulting warm summers and low snowpack means that the levels and reservoirs have decreased across the world. And that is reducing hydro output. In China in 2022, for example, during the unprecedented droughts, hydro output reduced by 80%. Now to address this, BC Hydro, they will soon start generating at their Site C 1100 megawatt dam on the Peace River. But for a truly resilient and future-proofed energy system, it does need that diversity through a combination of hydro, wind, solar and storage. And that's why BC Hydro have recently done a call for power. Well, we're forecasting um, a significant increase in the demand for power and, and um, you know, we're talking about between now and 2050, a doubling of the electricity system in Canada, and we're certainly part of that. We're forecasting by the end of the decade, um, a 15% or more increase in the demand for electricity. And that's after many years, almost two decades of a very flat or constant demand for power in, in British Columbia. So we uh, recognize the need for new resources and um, part of that is the call for power. So we've gone out for procurement for um, contracts for renewable power, um, most likely wind and solar power. There could be some hydro there. And um, uh, we issued the, the start of the process in April and, and expecting bids in, in September. A really interesting part of that is we've um, set as a requirement for the first time, a 25% minimum a First Nations ownership of the projects. And that's uh, certainly a first for British Columbia and something uh, we're really excited about and um, is a great example of um, economic reconciliation with First Nations, bringing them into our industry, uh, which they, they really want to be part of. As demand for electricity grows, we're going to see a greater diversity of supply and interesting interactions between different sources of renewable energy. But hydropower is the largest source of renewable electricity worldwide, providing 4,300 terawatt hours and a predicted 5,300 terawatt hours by 2030. What we've seen here today is just how complex it is to make sure that these hugely important bits of infrastructure can be as reliable, as resilient and as sustainable as possible. These backbones of our energy system certainly warrant our TLC.